My name is Olivia Brown. I am the Community Programs Coordinator for the Mercer Museum in Font Hill Castle. I am delighted to be part of this program um, and for having all of you join us today. I will be moderating the chat throughout, um, so I want to give just a couple pieces of information for those of you who are um, new to Zoom or uh, still kind of have some questions about the webinar format. Uh, so as a couple people have asked, you will not see a mute button because you are automatically muted. Um, your video and audio have automatically been turned off. Um, so you don't have to worry about muting yourself at any point. I do wanna let everyone know we will be recording this program for our archives um, and to put up on our YouTube page for anyone who wasn't able to join us or for all of you who might like to rewatch at any point. Um, you can contact me or our panelists through the chat or the Q&A function throughout. Um, so if you do have any questions uh, about the program and you wanna put them in those functions, I will then read those questions out to our speaker at the end. Um, so we will have time to answer your many burning questions that come up throughout the program. If you have any technical difficulties or need anything by way of our staff, please use the chat function um, and I will be monitoring that throughout the program. So today I am going to uh, turn it over to Christine Harrison, the president of the Friends of the Bucks County Historical Society, who will tell you a little about our speaker and welcome you to today's program. Thank you so much, Olivia, for everything you're doing to help us. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our first virtual presentation by the Friends Group. Um, we are the Friends of the Bucks County Historical Society, and I have the privilege of being the president of this group at this time. I always like to let everybody know because I'm welcoming back some of our friends, but I'm also welcoming new friends who have decided to join in and see our program. Our purpose with the Friends Group is that we supply volunteers for various functions and activities of the Bucks County Historical Society. We raise money in support of the BCHS. Um, I'm proud of all of the work that we've done in the past. Um, this year, we are hoping to help the staff here at the Mercer Museum in Font Hill with the purchase of library books and with helping the curation and the conservation for the curial, curatorial and exhibits. Um, all of this is possible by the generous donations of those who join in and help us with our friends. Um, we are excited for a few things that are happening. The friends have some new activities coming up. We are having our fifth annual Kite Day. Kite Day is um, a community event held at Font Hill. I was the brainchild of Nancy Berger, and I always like to give credit where credit is due. She brought that to us with the Fens, and it's a wonderful family event. So please mark your calendars for May 2nd, and you'll be able to find more updates on our website. We also have another presentation on our quarterly programs, and we're really looking forward to Trish Triolo, who is gonna do a first person um, on Alice Paul. That is also going to be on May 17th. So again, please check our website for updates and information. As a board, um, the, we do have bylaws. Um, so the friends have updated the bylaws and by the end of March, we're hoping to have our updated bylaws listed on our website for all of those who would like to peruse and see them, they will be there and available. I have one more little piece of business with the friends because I wanna make sure that we recognize Mary Jane Clements. Mary Jane Clements retired from our board. Um, she was, will be missed. She was our vice president. Um, she is gonna be missed for her kindness, her contributions, and just everything that she has done over the years to help us out as friends. And I just think it's important to recognize the people who do stand up and volunteer and put their time and effort. Mary Jane is a wonderful person. Um, she may not be on our board anymore, but she's certainly still our friend. And we always like to recognize that. And speaking of friends, I have the great privilege to introduce Corey Amsler. 
Curry Amsler is the vice president for the collections and the interpretations of the Bucks County Historical Society Mercer Museum. He joined us in 1988 and was is responsible for the care and the management of the exhibitions of the museum, as well as the extensive collection of tools and other artifacts of the pre-industrial America, as well as materials related to the Bucks County Historical Society. On a personal note, Eileen Shapiro is his lovely wife, who is an integral part of the Bucks County Friends. And um, so she has kindly asked Corey to come support the friends which he has. So I have the greatest pleasure of introducing Corey, who is going to give us the, our presentation today. I want to thank everybody for coming out and supporting the friends and joining us on this presentation. And Corey, I hand this off to you. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. And anything for a happy household. Um, let me get uh, get my slides up here. There we go. Um, so th thank you, Christine, and again, and, and thank you to really all of the friends for the invitation, something I'm absolutely happy to do. I know how much support um, the, uh, the Friends of the Bucks County Historical Society provide uh, to the museum, to our staff, um, and so I'm delighted to be able certainly to, to, to return the favor in a small way uh, this afternoon. Um, the, the program uh, that um, I'm, I'm going to uh, present today um, has its origins back in 2007. Uh, in that year, uh, we had uh, uh, developed a special tour at, uh, um, at Font Hill Castle uh, called the Intimate Henry Tour. And we just ran it for well, just a matter really of, of weeks or months. I can't even recall uh, exactly how long uh, right now, but um, it was intended to really, as the, as the name of this talk implies, get, uh, get into sort of the private side of Mercer. You know, we're, we're very used to talking about uh, uh, Henry Mercer as architect, as a scholar, as a tile maker, as a museum founder, all of as a, as a, um, a collector, all of the sort of very public um, uh, aspects of his life, which of course are are tremendous and varied, and and uh, uh, and you know we're we're very grateful to have everything that he gave us uh, in at Font Hill and the Mercer Museum uh, and his legacy. Um, but of course, uh, every uh, every individual has their private side, um, and uh, and so um, so that's what this uh, that tour was about, and and what I'm uh, uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, today. Let's move on here. Um, so I think you know many of us know uh, Font Hill, Font Hill Castle, uh, built between 1908 and 1912, and it always had a public component, even as it served as a refuge for the the private Henry Mercer. Uh, Mercer designed Font Hill to be a showroom for his tiles, uh, uh, intended to be a he intended it to be a museum of of tiles and prints, um, both during and after his lifetime. Uh, but again, this afternoon, we're going to focus uh, on Font Hill as Mercer's home, um, as the place where the more intimate side of, of Henry can be found. And after all, I mean, we have to, as, as much as, as we, um, we celebrate the public side of, of uh, Henry Mercer, uh, he was a real person. Um, and he lived at Font Hill. It was his home. Um, he built it to be lived in. Um, so with that, let's, let's launch a little bit into um, the intimate Henry. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about Font Hill as Mercer's home, as his private retreat, uh, where he conducted his life. He interacted with friends, colleagues, family, employees, visitors, and of course, pets. Um, we'll touch on some of his personal relationships, his political and social positions, uh, and his private concerns and passions. Now, the, the structure of that Intimate Henry tour when we presented it at Font Hill back in 2007 um, really featured about nine or 10 uh, rooms in the house. And each of those rooms was sort of set up with a small vignette or setting, uh, a bit conjectural, um, but specially recreated to represent a particular time or event uh, in Henry Mercer's life at Font Hill. Um, and so I'm going to ask uh, you folks, uh, as we sort of work through this tour vicariously and virtually, 
to imagine or visualize uh, Mercer and others living at the house between 1912 and 1930. And we'll jump back and forth a little bit uh, in time. And again, our purpose is helping to see Mercer as a little bit more of a complex character to answer some questions about his personality and the way he lived at Font Hill. Uh, so um, as, we, uh, as we get to this next slide, um, Mercer is host, the, the social Henry Mercer. Um, this vignette is really focused on uh, the saloon at Font Hill. So uh, for those of you who see the slide or those of you who may be familiar with the saloon, I'm gonna ask as with all of these vignettes, perhaps you know, to close your eyes a little bit and kind of imagine uh, with me. So let's imagine uh, it's a late summer day, September 15th, 1912. And Henry Mercer has been residing in his new home, Font Hill, only for a few months. Since then, many friends and neighbors and colleagues and, in fact, curiosity seekers have found their way to Mercer's unusual dwelling to be inspired by its imaginative design, to meet its architect, or simply to gawk. Uh, Mercer's guests this particular evening in 1912 sit down with him for a pleasant supper. And leading the group is Charles Conrad Abbott, a former colleague at the University Museum with, which, with whom uh, Mercer has had some academic disagreements and a falling out, in fact, in the 1890s. Still, the men uh, remained on cordial terms personally, mostly through Abbott's efforts. Abbott's brought along a copy of his recently published book. The table is set and flowers are visible in several vases around the room. The simple supper menu might have included scrambled eggs and pork or lamb chops coupled with a glass of wine or champagne. Table conversation likely ranges from Abbott's new book and the current state of archeological exploration to the jaw-dropping architecture of Fot Hill, Mercer's gathering of his tools of the Nation Maker collection or his plans in that year after dinner, his guests enjoyed a glass of scotch, Irish whiskey, or a fine port, and perhaps a cigar as well. And shortly after this visit, Dr. Abbott wrote to his friend, Dear Mercer, we got home all in good time, and I voiced the others in declaring you the incomparable host. He included a poem that begins, Font Hill, thou art, thou art a mystery to me. So we know that, that uh, Mercer had uh, an appetite uh, for fine food and drink. And we know this from numerous uh, house bills and receipts that uh, are maintained uh, in, the, uh, in the archives. Uh, and uh, this, this all befitted uh, Mercer's class and status. Uh, he had a wide variety of meats and fish and vegetables and beverages delivered to his door for his own consumption. Uh, in that of his guests. He loved cut flowers. Uh, he had freshly cut roses, carnations, asters, sweet peas uh, delivered weekly by a local florist, as it happens, the Darlington, uh, the Darlington uh, florist. In fact, I had the, the uh, opportunity a number of years ago to speak with Hillborn Darlington, who sadly is now deceased, but he recalled as a young boy delivering uh, flowers to, uh, to Font Hill. Mercer's table settings were not fancy, but rather evoked history, simplicity, and handcraft in keeping with his arts and crafts and anti-modernist uh, sensibilities. Uh, we know he ordered uh, a set of Dedham pottery. Uh, we know that he ordered a very simple stoneware pottery from, or dinnerware from, uh, uh, from Tennessee. Um, so we have some idea of his, uh, of his table appointments. Um, in addition to, uh, to enjoying uh, Irish whiskey, scotch he offered, uh, port, um, uh, champagne uh, was, uh, was frequently on the menu at Font Hill. Um, one individual recalled, this was sort of whispered down the lane, uh, but uh, Mercer often enjoyed a split of champagne with lunch uh, at times. Uh, and he was also an avid uh, smoker of, of Cuban cigars. Now, throughout his years at Font Hill, a steady stream of visitors, friends and colleagues, neighbors and curiosity seekers, well-known personages and everyday folks uh, came to tour and find inspiration uh, in Mercer's home and his endeavors. Some Mercer entertained, others just passed through on tours. Uh, 
And in the first few years after Mercer uh, moved to Fod Hill, he entertained family, friends, and colleagues frequently. However, by the 1920s, as his health declined, he hosted fewer guests for dinner and overnight stays. But uh, seen here are some of the visitors uh, to Fod Hill. Um, in the upper, uh, upper right is uh, Henry Ford, um, who uh, visited during a trip to, uh, to Doylestown. Uh, at the lower right, Victor Herbert, uh, a, a band and orchestra leader. Uh, the uh, cyanotype at the bottom uh, with the blue tint is William, uh, William Edgar Guile, a fellow Doylestown resident, um, global traveler known as the first, uh, uh, the first American to walk the entire uh, length of the, uh, of the uh, Great Wall of China. Uh, in the center is Charles Conrad Abbott. Uh, the upper left, Owen Wister, author of The Virginian, who Mercer was very close to and close friends with, uh, and who visited Font Hill again on multiple occasions. And at lower left, um, uh, Walperga Valperga von Iserborn, uh, Mercer's niece, all of whom and many others uh, visited Font Hill um, uh, to be entertained uh, or accommodated uh, by, uh, by Mercer. Uh, and here, of course, is uh, is Henry Ford's uh, signature in the uh, in the in the top um, of the Font Hill guest register when he came to uh, uh, to visit Doylestown. So Mercer uh, could be a very social being and enjoyed people, at least when his health was good, um, visiting Font Hill. So the social side of Henry Mercer is one aspect of his private side. And now we move, uh, sort of continuing our virtual tour, uh, we move into uh, the library, um, where uh, during the original Intimate Henry tour, we had the library sort of set up to kind of represent Mercer as a lover of, of music. Um, and so again, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to sort of picture in your mind's eye a fall day in 1920, uh, in which the uh, piano uh, has been pulled out from its uh, location along one wall of the room into the center. And Laura Long, Mercer's housekeeper, is perched on the piano bench dutifully playing Irish dance tunes from one of several compilations her employer has purchased, had purchased earlier in the year and other music is scattered around nearby. Mercer's lying on the sofa here with a blanket over him. And next to him is his violin, which he picks up and fingers occasionally as if remembering a tune played long ago. A cigar sits in a Moravian pottery ash receiver on a nearby table along with a tumbler of Irish whiskey. On a table by the window, a recording of the Irish dance tune Geese in the Bog is queued up on a Victrola record player recently acquired by Mercer. And he calls to Laura to play the piano tune faster or slower, then rises to jot down notes in a small ledger. His feet rest on a small oriental rug, and he's working through as many different tunes as he can find, and Laura will play. He's already logged over 200. He asks her for the next tune, which she names, and he begins to whistle it from memory, comforted by the sound and memories it evokes. Laura renews her attack on the piano keys. So again, just, a, just an image of, of what might have been a, a scene in 1920. And in fact, uh, Mercer was deeply interested uh, in folk music and its origins, uh, particularly uh, Irish dance music. Uh, it was a music was a comfort to Mercer when he found himself beset uh, by personal problems, worried about his health, or distressed as he often was by reading the newspaper and and uh, and uh, learning of world affairs. Uh, and Mercer was heard uh, or played on many occasions uh, at Font Hill. Um, there are accounts Mercer uh, invited individuals to come in and play for him. Uh, an individual Irish musician named Daniel Sullivan uh, came in and, and Mercer said he tuned up his, uh, his old violin and, and, uh, and played tunes for him. Um, in, um, uh, there was a, uh, a concert, uh, sort of a benefit for the Episcopal Church in Doylestown uh, that brought uh, 100, uh, at least 100 guests uh, to Fod Hill, probably one assumes in the saloon and the balcony overlooking uh, the saloon, uh, to, uh, to hear a, a series of musical performances. Um, so, uh, so again, uh, music uh, was often heard uh, in the house. And again, especially passionate about uh, Irish, uh, Irish dance music. 
And in uh, one of Mercer's books, there's quite a bit of marginalia. This one, uh, Ryan's uh, 1050 uh, reels and jigs. And it's, it's here that uh, Mercer sort of recounts his, his initial discovery, or at least one of his early discoveries of, uh, of his affection for Irish dance music, uh, talking about uh, one afternoon he was loitering in Doylestown and, and heard the sounds of bagpipes. Um, and these were Irish pipes, Illin pipes. Um, and hurried to find that an Irish play had come to town. Uh, ultimately, he goes on to indicate he, um, uh, he invited the musicians back to his room at, at uh, his family's home at Aldi to continue uh, the concert. And now in our virtual tour, uh, we move on to the kitchen and moving a little bit behind the scenes uh, in Font Hill and thinking about Mercer as, as a boss. Uh, Mercer as an employer. And so let's imagine uh, it is now uh, October 1919 and Fothill has a new cook. Seen here is not the new cook, but this is a, uh, a photo rendering of, uh, of Laura Long, who ultimately married uh, Frank Swain. Um, but the new cook uh, in 1919 uh, was Miss Amelia Hall, age 62, uh, temperamental and rather rotund, and she's busy in the kitchen, as we imagine this, preparing breakfast for Mercer, Laura, uh, Frank Swain, who at that time was Mercer's tile works manager, who had recently taken up residence upstairs, uh, and other staff already at work around the house and garden. Cooking pots sit on the huge coal-fired stove, which, despite the cool fall weather, has warmed the room to the point that Amelia is sweating profusely. Her parrot provides some noisy company. He sits squawking in a cage near one of the windows, crying discomfortingly, fire, 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 uh, apparently due to the fire in the stove. Uh, a large basket with dirty laundry sits on the floor near the door to be picked up later by Emma Cather's Mercer's laundress. And a tray with breakfast rests on the dumb waiter. Mercer has decided to take his morning meal in the breakfast room. It will be scrambled eggs, his favorite and only, uh, only Laura uh, could cook scrambled eggs well. Uh, two of Mercer's dogs are underfoot and Amelia mutters something about them under her breath. Uh, Laura then heads upstairs to serve Mr. Harry his eggs. So that's the scene again we're, we're talking about. Now, Laura, Laura Long directed Mercer's uh, household. I mean, she's often spoken about as the housekeeper, but she was far more than that uh, to Mercer and to the functioning of, of, uh, of Font Hill. I mean, she was the, the household manager managing the other staff. And then, uh, you know, after uh, she was done with all of, all of those tasks and, and her other tasks as, as housekeeper, house manager, and so on, um, then she was often, you know, Mercer's uh, companion at times for different activities or his helper. Um, she talked about pasting, uh, pasting letters on photos that made their way into Mercer's book, uh, Ancient Carpenter's Tools. She would, um, uh, she would help uh, Mercer uh, prepare Christmas cards around the holidays to send out. Um, so she was, uh, she was, uh, an incredibly important figure uh, in Mercer's life and in Mercer's ability to do uh, everything that he did. Um, now at any one time, uh, Mercer's staff uh, generally consisted of Laura and Frank, who was primarily employed at the tile works, a cook like Amelia, another part-time housekeeper, a uh, cleaner, and a laundress. And others might be called on for extra help at certain times. And all of this, again, as I said, enabled him to concentrate on his artistic and scholarly objectives and freed him to pursue his ambitions and creative vision. They were his, his enablers in a sense. Um, Mercer could be, uh, from all accounts, a difficult, uh, impatient, and demanding boss. Uh, he was given uh, to angry, critical outbursts that he regretted uh, and tried to make up for uh, later with acts of uh, gener generosity. Um, and, and here you see, um, you know, Laura was not without her frustrations, uh, as the, the quote indicates, because I have everything on my mind to get. When big dinner comes twice a week, it's a good deal to look after and never get a day off unless I nearly get down on my knees. Uh, she was moved to tears, apparently, at times, as she confessed, by, uh, by Mercer's demands. Um, but, you know, they would, uh, she would persevere and, uh, and he would uh, eventually feel bad uh, and do what he could to, uh, uh, to make it up to her. 
Now, when Mercer, when Mercer first moved to Fod Hill, his staff each received the same monthly wage. That was $22.16. Uh, the previous year, 1911, however, Laura had complained about her salary. Good for her. Uh, and uh, it was raised to $26.57, slightly differentiating her from the salary of the cook, uh, Lena Fonash, who continued uh, to receive that $22. I would say Laura eventually, uh, at the time of Mercer's death, made it up to about $70 a month, which in today's dollars uh, is around $1,100, $1,200 a month, something like that. Um, not a lot of money, but of course, uh, she was also receiving room and, and, and board. Now, moving on to a different aspect of Mercer's life and kind of a different conjectural uh, vignette. Uh, in the yellow room, uh, one of Fod Hill's many guest rooms, um, we're going to try to picture Mercer as the romantic suitor. Um, it's April 19th, uh, 1917, and Mercer's longtime friend, Frances Lerman, has come to visit, accompanied by her sister, Catherine. And Frances's hat, gloves, muff, coat, and suitcases have been deposited in the yellow room where she'll spend the next few days. She notices immediately that her room has been prepared with freshly cut flowers. At the age of 48, she remains as beautiful and vivacious as when she first met young Harry Mercer some three decades ago. And Frances playfully signs the guest register in colored pencil so as to, sign, as to stand out. Arrived 19th of April, not yet departed. As Frances settles into her room, she thinks how close she came to marrying this man some years ago. This might have been my home, she muses silently. Glancing at the Bluebeard tile series, she turns the idea over and around in her head and decides she did the right thing. I really didn't want to be Mrs. Anybody, she thinks to herself, something that Frances Lerman actually uh, said. And Harry and I could never have gotten along. She never officially talked about uh, Henry Mercer as, uh, as, a, as a love interest or a potential partner, but she alluded to a, uh, a millionaire from Philadelphia who she came close to marrying. We can only assume or suggest that that might have been uh, Mercer. In our conjectural vignette, um, as, as Francis is uh, preparing uh, to go down to dinner, um, she may have, she still realizes she has feelings um, for the distinguished 61 year old gentleman scholar waiting for her downstairs. And a friend of Mercer's, and here's Francis Lerman, by the way, and Francis's signature in the, uh, in the Font Hill guest book. A friend of Mercer's did write many years later that he was a bachelor uh, who had loved and lost. Um, while there's evidence of other possible relationships in Mercer's life, uh, his loss was probably this Francis Lerman. Uh, she was a member of a prominent Baltimore area family. She was called at one point the Bell of Baltimore, apparently. Um, she was an independent spirit, uh, not unlike Mercer, uh, but was also much that Mercer was apparently not. Playful, uh, outgoing, a bit daring, and seemingly willing to embrace modernity. As early as the 1880s, when they toured Europe with friends and family, there was some hope on the part of the family that the two would marry. And shortly before Mercer began building Fod Hill, their long-term relationship, though, apparently uh, ended, though they remained very close friends. She visited Fod Hill at least three times uh, in 1916 and 1917. And Lerman came from, uh, from Maryland uh, for Mercer's funeral in 1930. Um, when Mercer's chauffeur, Benny Barnes, drove her to the burial site of the Presbyterian Church. And when the graveside service was ended, it was she who stayed behind, uh, asking uh, Benny to wait. Uh, she wanted to be alone, and she waited there <clears throat> uh, at the cemetery alone until Mercer's grave was, was filled in. Now, Mercer may have cut himself, cut himself off uh, from others and, uh, and uh, from romantic relationships. Um, due to his chronic illnesses, his dedication to his work, or for some uh, unknown reasons. And it's not known for certain what role Mercer's case of gonorrhea, which he apparently contracted in his mid-20s, uh, played in his failure uh, to marry. A note penned by Mercer on the diagnosis, and the diagnosis, again, is dated here, was 1882, although it references that uh, the gonorrhea was contracted originally about three years earlier, which would have been when Mercer was still 
uh, a student at Harvard University. Uh, but it's not known again what uh, what uh, role um, the gonorrhea may have played in Mercer's reluctance to uh, to marry. Um, a note penned by Mercer uh, on his diagnosis can be interpreted perhaps in a couple of ways, but it may have given Mercer pause about entering into a serious relationship. Gonorrhea very dangerous. No affections of the heart. Now, uh, continuing again on our on our tour through Fod Hill uh, on the private to the private Henry Mercer, we now pass uh, into the study, um, where uh, we can try to picture Mercer uh, as a social and political critic. And we don't think about uh, Mercer. Well, I think about him a little bit as a social critic. We often don't think about Mercer's uh, politics very much. Um, but again, we're going to uh, we're going to take. Uh, imagine in our mind's eye going back to April 17th, 1916, uh, that Mercer's reclining here on the lumpy, uncomfortable looking sofa, uh, dictating a letter. His typist tries to keep up. He's nearly surrounded by a stack of popular magazines, a great wedge of newspaper articles he has clipped on subjects that interest him, and a pile of correspondence waiting to be answered. Today, his mind is occupied with the latest news from the Great War, now in its second year and continuing to uh, tear at the land and, and people of Europe. He's been clipping newspaper articles about the war and pasting them deliberately into a scrapbook, a pastime that maybe offers him a vague sense of control over events for which he has absolutely no control to his great frustration. And his thoughts likely turn to his sister, Layla, and her husband, the Baron, uh, and to his many friends trying to ride out the conflict in Europe. As he ponders the war's devastation, he recalls the towering cathedrals, rugged castles, romantic squares, and narrow medieval streets that fired his imagination during trips abroad uh, decades ago, now perhaps in flames and ruins. He may wonder too uh, about the son he allegedly fathered out of wedlock in Austria some 30 years ago. Mercer's also become aware that members of Harvard University, his alma mater, uh, have joined the pro-war anti-German chorus. He expected more from his alma mater. And he instructs his typist to begin another letter to the editor of the Boston Transcript. He has some things he wants to say. And Mercer, um, Mercer had um, very strong opinions, not only about art and history, but also about politics, religion, labor, fashion, and, and world affairs. And World War I, uh, as the slide suggests, was a very difficult time for, for Mercer. Uh, as a young man, he traveled extensively through Europe, including through Germany and Austria. He had many friends and colleagues in the region, and he had family again. Uh, in 1888, his sister Leila uh, had married Baron Hubert von Iserborn of Austria, and the couple later resided in Bavaria, where a daughter, Valperga, was born. Mercer's personal relationships, as well as his study of German and European history and his longstanding affection for German folkways and culture predisposed him towards a sympathy for Germany and its national ambitions. And on May 20th, 1887, a child whom Mercer was alleged to have fathered was born in Austria, the son of uh, one Francisca Blessberger. In 1893, Mercer sent money to support the upbringing of the child, Leopold, then in an orphanage in the village of Milk. Nothing further is known of this child and research conducted uh, years ago in Austrian public records failed to determine whether or not he grew to adulthood or to indicate what may have happened to him. His mother later married in 1898 an Austrian tailor. It's also not known whether Mercer had any knowledge of the child's life or fate after 1893. Now, Mercer wrote a number of editorial pieces and letters on the war and its causes, criticizing especially those who laid responsibility for the war entirely on Germany and those who made inflammatory and ultra patriotic statements rather than pursuing, as he would have thought uh, was necessary, reason and conciliation. In the summer of 1917, the war sort of came home from Mercer in the form of local criticism that the new, his new historical society building, the Mercer Museum, 
was not flying an American flag like nearly all of the other homes and businesses and public buildings in Doylestown. Well, Mercer didn't believe uh, that non-governmental buildings should be required to display the flag and was opposed to what he saw as excessive displays of patriotism. He also decried what he referred to as the mob public sentiment uh, that was influencing the society's trustees. During this time, a look at the, at the uh, letters to the editor and the, the editorials in the local paper were all about the patriotic fervor of the time. Um, and the historical society was building was in fact noticed uh, to when it was not displaying the American flag and was called out uh, on that by a number of, of letter writers and correspondents to the local paper. So finally, uh, trustees of the historical society caved into the pressure. Uh, and in fact, um, a wool flag was ordered and arrived at the historical society in the late summer or early fall of, uh, of 1918, just before uh, the end of, uh, of World War I. Mercer thought seriously uh, when the trustees did submit to, again, what he referred to as the mob, thought seriously about resigning from the historical society, though he never did. He did, however, leave his church, which at that time was St. Paul's Episcopal Church, uh, when it insisted on displaying the flag. And Mercer um, you know, wrote uh, quite a bit about this, um, feeling that uh, churches should not, uh, you know, they were, they were, in his words, dethroning Christ um, by uh, celebrating uh, a form of patriotism with which he did not agree. Again, Mercer's words. Mercer is difficult to categorize in today's politics. Um, he was a proponent of, of racial equality and animal welfare, uh, environmental and historical preservation. On the other hand, uh, he was strongly suspicious of labor unions, patriotic displays, and, and modernity in general. Traveling now uh, in our virtual tour into the East Bedroom at Font Hill, and it is October 1925, if we can imagine that, and Frank and Laura Swain have just returned from an extended vacation in the British Isles, instigated, arranged, and underwritten by Henry Mercer. The trip was part honeymoon, part reward for long and faithful service, and part vicarious travel uh, for their employer. After more than four months touring Britain, during which they sent many letters back to Mr. Harry, uh, describing their experiences, the Swains returned to Doylestown to resume their respective roles as Mercer's Tile Works manager and, and uh, the housekeeper or household manager. A group of family and friends had gathered to serenade the couple upon their arrival at Font Hill, and now Laura sits alone, alone on her bed. Again, we're sort of imagining this in our mind's eye, surrounded by literature and souvenirs from the trip, including a primitive lighting device purchased as a gift for her boss. Trying to work her way back into her role as director of Mercer's household, we can imagine Laura thumbing through the house book, which has been started years ago to summarize and record household expenses. The volume sits on a built-in desk along with a pile of receipts. The house phone, also on the desk, puts her in touch with the cook in the kitchen and with the terrace room, Mercer's bedroom, and study. Uh, Laura has given nearly two decades of her still young life to Henry Mercer. And over those decades, she's been, she's been grateful for the knowledge, grace, and sophistication uh, that her employer has contributed to her life, and perhaps just a bit, a bit regretful for what she may have missed. Suddenly, Mercer's voice crackles over the house phone, asking her to help him with a project. Laura dutifully obeys. She'll finish unpacking later. So the slide asks, you know, to what degree was this an arranged marriage? Well, you know, Frank Swain uh, began working for Mercer in 1896 as an archaeology assistant. He moved into Font Hill uh, in 1916. Laura Long uh, came to work first at, uh, at Old Aldi uh, as a maid uh, in 1907. She later moved to Mercer with Mercer to uh, Linden, uh, the Linden boarding house where Mercer resided uh, while Font Hill was under construction, and then ultimately accompanied him to Font Hill. And Frank and Laura were married at St. John Divine the Church, St. John the Divine Church in New York City on April 23rd, 1925. She was 38. Uh, Frank was 49 at the time. Uh, two days later, the couple sailed to England. The marriage had apparently been contemplated for some time. As early as 1919, uh, Frank had purchased a diamond ring for Laura and wrote her a letter 
asking whether she considered them engaged. So there was clearly some affection there, at least on, on Frank's part. Um, and uh, uh, we don't know quite you know, what Laura's reaction uh, to that letter was. Now, Mercer's precise role in engineering or arranging the marriage isn't known, though cementing their relationship clearly served his interests and kept Laura close at a time when, as his health declined, he would most need her assistance. And it gave him reliable heirs uh, who could trust, he could trust to care for his home, continue his business, and preserve his legacy after his death. So in fact, Mercer rewrote his will uh, to include the Swains during Frank and Laura's trip to England. So Mercer did encourage, plan, and, and finance the Swain's trip, giving them each $300 in spending money. Continuing our tour again, we move to the Garrett um, and uh, focused here a little bit on Henry Mercer's family circle. The Garrett was Mercer's essentially his dressing room at the time that he was uh, residing towards the end of his life uh, in uh, the uh, terrace bedroom. And again, we're going to imagine uh, in our mind's eye that it's late summer in 1927. And Henry Mercer is in the Garrett at Font Hill dressing for a night out. Laura has laid out clothes for him. And Henry Mercer's brother, William, and his wife, Martha, have recently completed construction of their own dream house, the new Aldi, after they had torn down the old Aldi. Now, Mercer had been invited, invited to travel to his brother's house to read from a soon-to-be-published collection of short stories, November Night Tales. Uh, for many years, Mercer had dabbled at writing both poetry and prose, and now in the declining years of his life, he's finally arranged for some of his fiction to be published. And in keeping with his romantic sensibilities and his appreciation for the work of authors like Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, the seven Gothic tales uh, com compiled in November Night Tales um, combine elements of mystery, suspense, and the occult. He thinks it's kind of a, he thinks it's kind of his brother uh, to make the invitation and pleased that he feels well enough for an evening out. So Mercer recalls too, perhaps, how his family has long supported him in all of his artistic and historical endeavors. Still, there's been some friction between him and his brother of late, and he's never warmed uh, to Willie's, life, uh, Willie's wife, Martha. Aware that Willie has several guests who will be in attendance this evening, Henry grudgingly dresses for the occasion. He glances into his bedroom at a clock to check the time. And the stage is set. Um, so some of, of Mercer's uh, family influences, uh, Henry Chapman, Mercer's grandfather, uh, seen in the upper left of the slide here, um, was an attorney, judge, state senator, US congressman. He traveled extensively uh, in Europe, held interests in art and history, read papers at meetings of the Bucks County Historical Society, and was a collector of prints. Elizabeth Chapman Lawrence in the upper right here, uh, Mercer's aunt was widowed at age 40, but inherited this, a substantial fortune uh, from her husband, Timothy Bigelow Lawrence. And with those funds, uh, Aunt Layla built the original Aldi, old Aldi, supported her nephews uh, and her nieces' travels and education, uh, assisted Henry in starting the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works and provided a legacy that uh, Henry used to build uh, Font Hill. His mother, Mary Rebecca Chapman uh, Mercer, at lower left here, uh, was devoted to her family, contributed perhaps a sense of refinement, intelligence to her son. She also had an artistic bent, sketching and painting uh, for pleasure. Now Mercer's father, William Mercer Sr., seen at, at lower right here, uh, or was a former uh, naval officer. And following the construction of the original Aldi, he pursued horticulture and oversaw the creation of the gardens at the family estate. He's reputed to have a rather bad temperature, temper, a rather bad temper, uh, something that uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, son may have inherited. And, you know, and it's funny, you know, reading, reading Mercer's accounts of his father, um, that often end in some uh, some argument. <laughs> you know, clearly they they did not always get along. Now sometimes it was just, 
you know, teenage things or young man things. I mean, it's completely explicable why his father may have been upset when uh, Mercer was playing music in his room or having friends over in his room at Aldi at 1230 in the morning. Um, but uh, his father didn't seem to like his dogs. Uh, his father didn't seem to like a number of other things. Uh, and uh, so how, how well they got along in their life is, is certainly questionable. Now, a major rift developed uh, in, uh, between Mercer and uh, his brother, Willie, uh, around um, the time that, uh, that William and Martha Mercer uh, constructed the new Aldi uh, and decided to tear down uh, the, uh, the old Aldi, the home that was built uh, by uh, Mercer's aunt, Elizabeth Chapman Lawrence. And um, uh, Benny Barnes, uh, many years later, sort of recalled and is quoted here, remembering that um, Mercer never wanted to drive by uh, Aldi after the old house was torn down. Um, and uh, Barnes said he never took him that way again. Now, I will conclude uh, by noting here, uh, just having set up the scene with uh, Mercer getting ready to go for a, uh, an evening of, uh, of uh, reading his, his tales at his brother's that that, that uh, reading never came off. Um, he got there, he told uh, Benny Barnes, the chauffeur to, to wait for a minute. Uh, he went to the door, engaged in a argument with his brother and then stamped off. As it turns out, um, and the story goes, that uh, uh, Mercer was, uh, was not on daylight savings time uh, at a time when, um, uh, when his brother was on daylight savings time. So Mercer had arrived late uh, for the reading, hence the argument and, and Mercer's decision to, uh, to return uh, without uh, participating in the, in the readings. November Night Tales, uh, his effort uh, in the realm of, of literature uh, was published ultimately in 1928. And now we go on uh, to the Columbus Room at Font Hill, where we're going to imagine Mercer, uh, the dog lover, uh, the pet lover. Um, and it's early. And here we have in the in the photograph you see here Mercer's dog uh, Rollo uh, and a couple of dog collars. Um, and we're picturing, we're imagining uh, again that it's early January in 1924, and Mercer's favorite canine companion, Rollo, has now been dead for about seven years. And when Rollo died under the cherry tree in front of Font Hill in 1916, Mercer had penned a tender tribute to his beloved pet in his notebook. May his footsteps, Mercer wrote, outlast many generations of men on his stairways at Font Hill in the Bucks County Historical Society, as Mercer wrote at the time. But despite Rollo's passing, uh, Mercer found comfort and companionship with his surviving dogs, two of whom, Captain and Jack, and this is Jack seen, uh, perhaps seen here, uh, were Rollo's own progeny. On the last day of December 1923, uh, Mercer ordered from H.R. Gaiman, a uh, Doylestown harness maker, two new collars for his dogs, Captain and Larry. The leather collars were made especially for the animals, complete with engraved brass plates featuring the dog's names. And it's easy to imagine now here in the Columbus Room at the foot of Rollo's stairs where uh, years previously Rollo had been uh, allowed and encouraged probably to leave his footprints in, in wet concrete. Um, here in the Columbus Room, uh, Mercer first presents uh, the collars to his pets, buckle, buckling each around a massive canine neck. Dishes on the floor hold water for the animals, and a tin of dog biscuits is nearby. Mercer easily owned more than a dozen dogs, probably many more, uh, over his adult lifetime, and he favored dogs of the, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever breed. He may have appreciated their temperament, um, he certainly did, uh, but it's also likely he was interested in the historical connection uh, between his family and the breed's origins. Uh, John Francis Mercer, uh, Mercer's great grandfather, um, had actually um, been given one of two and sources disagree, either Newfoundland or Ab uh, Labrador pups uh, that had been lost in a shipwreck uh, off the coast of Maryland. Uh, Mercer's uh, great-grandfather received one of these and, um, and these pups became um, sort of the progenitors of the uh, Chesapeake 
Bay Retriever breed after they had been bred together with other hounds and other retrievers. And again, Henry's favorite uh, was Rollo. Um, this uh, image uh, appears in, um, uh, is included, uh, this photograph is included in uh, uh, the manuscript collection, Mercer's manuscript collection um, found at Font Hill. Uh, it's presumed that this is and was intended to be a memorial of some kind uh, to Mercer's uh, dog Rollo. Uh, why it was never, um, never actually placed uh, or uh, what happened to it, uh, unfortunately, is unknown. But conjecturally, again, we sort of imagine that Mercer had anticipated um, this as a, as a memorial to, uh, to Rollo. And it wasn't only dogs. Uh, Font Hill and, and its grounds were something of a sanctuary for birds and other wildlife, emblematic of Mercer's strong affection for nature and the kindness he demonstrated for animals of all types. Uh, in 1914, uh, Font Hill was named as a bird sanctuary in the local paper, and public school students made birdhouses, which were placed around the grounds. Pigeons uh, were encouraged to roost in nooks provided in the garage, though Laura had to clean up after them by scrubbing the terrace repeatedly. Uh, bats, spiders, and other wildlife were allowed to exist unmolested and undisturbed uh, at Font Hill. Um, there's a story, um, and I can't remember who, the, who recounted this, um, but um, that uh, uh, Mercer tried to rescue a, a bat that had fallen into a, a pond and he was, uh, he was seen by two young boys. And uh, as soon as he tried to rescue the bat, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it sank its, uh, its teeth into his, uh, into his finger. Uh, he did not want the boys to see that he was obviously in pain and in distress. So he walked behind a tree to extract the fangs from his finger. Um, but is it again, another um, uh, sort of anecdote of Mercer's uh, affection uh, for, uh, uh, for nature and, and the animal world. Finally, we come uh, to, uh, to Henry Mercer at the, at the close of his life. Um, and here we are in, uh, in the terrace bedroom. And again, we're one last, one last vignette, one last time to sort of uh, perhaps imagine a scene uh, that might have uh, existed at Font Hill. And it's March in 1930. Uh, too ill to rise from bed, Mercer's spent and he feels his life slipping away. I'm busted, he said. He's, as he confides to Joseph Sanford, a young artist and designer who Mercer befriended in the early 1920s. Dr. Herbert Croft calls on his patient, who he's treating the best as he can for Bright's disease, a chronic kidney ailment that caused Mercer intense abdominal or back pain, headaches, fevers, and frequent urination. The disease has finally progressed to near renal failure. A white sheet is suspended from the ceiling covering the bed on three sides while a folding screen blocks the foot of the bed. Both are attempts to keep late winter drafts off of the seriously ill man. A fire burns in the hearth to help warm the room. And propped up by pillows, Mercer lies under a mound of blankets and woven coverlets, a hot water bottle nearby. His nurse hovers and encourages him to take his medications. Drug bottles and other aids are on a table next to the bed, along with a cup of tea, which is, which is getting cold. Dr. Pearsall, a specialist, has come to call. He's placed his bag on the chair next to Mercer's bed as he checks the old, man, the old man's heart and breathing with his stethoscope. An old friend has also arrived, Owen Wister, author of The Virginian and other Western novels. Mercer is disheartened and discouraged, feeling that his life's work is both underappreciated and unfinished. Worcester relays a compliment from another old friend, anthropologist David Randall McIver, who's called Mercer probably the greatest potter in the last thousand years. In modesty, the old man waves off the accolade, but a slight smile of, of satisfaction, we might imagine, uh, crosses his face. And given Mercer's substantial illnesses and, and significant bouts of ill health uh, during his lifetime. It's actually remarkable uh, that he was able to accomplish uh, all that he did. Um, and he suffered you know, from a variety of ailments throughout his life, most, appar uh, most apparently related to the gonorrhea that he contracted as a young man. 
Uh, Bright's disease um, is a historical name for a form of kidney disease that involves a inflammation or infection of the kidneys accompanied by pain, swelling, fevers, all of the, the symptoms that Mercer exhibited. And Mercer seems to have treated uh, onsets of the illness with, uh, um, uh, with opiates uh, for the pain and castor oil, a laxative. Now, according to Mercer's death certificate, death was caused by a combination of Bright's disease and myocarditis, the latter uh, a term for the inflammation of the myocardium, the muscular part of the heart, uh, generally as the result of a viral or bacterial infection. It's likely that Mercer's gonorrhea contracted again in his 20s and untreated at the time uh, by antibiotics may have caused a secondary infection or inflammation in his urinary tract and kidneys or triggered an auto autoimmune disorder. Uh, that led to Bright's disease. The malaria uh, that Mercer is believed to have contracted during the Corwith expedition to the Yucatan in the 1890s uh, may also have been a contributing factor uh, in the onset uh, of this disease. And in turn, Mercer's myocarditis was very likely triggered by the effects of the, uh, the gonorrhea and Bright's disease uh, with additional strain uh, placed on the heart by his kidneys failure to effectively remove fluids. So that's, I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV, uh, but, um, but that seems to be the, the nature of, of Mercer's illnesses, uh, the cause and effect uh, that plagued him for a good part of his life, um, and what ultimately led to, to his death uh, in March of 1930. Now, Benny Barnes uh, records um, in his recollections, um, Mercer's chauffeur again, um, the sort of Mercer's last moments, last breaths, uh, which, um, uh, which are quoted here. Um, Dr. Mercer had been ill for several weeks, had nurses around the clock. On this Sunday, I knew he was very sick and could not live long. Um, the, the local doctor had been called, said Mercer uh, could not live the day out. Uh, Frank asked me to call the specialist, tell him not to come. Went upstairs, Frank and I stood in the doorway. Finally, Mr. Harry took his last breath. It was about 3.30, uh, March 9th, 1930. Um, and that was, that was, of course, the end of, of Henry Mercer, both the public uh, and the private uh, Henry Mercer. Um, you know, every, every time that, that Frank or Laura or Bar uh, Benny uh, referred to uh, Henry Mercer, it was always Mr. Harry, uh, Mr. Harry. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of obvious that uh, Frank Swain was the one to provide the information for Mercer's death certificate because Mercer's death certificate does not say Henry Chapman Mercer or Henry Mercer, it says Mr. Harry Mercer. Um, um, again, just a, a small, uh, small uh, anecdote there. So a funeral service was held uh, for Mercer at Font Hill with the service itself taking place in the saloon. Uh, the family was seated up in the balcony in the alcove and Mercer's casket closed uh, was in the library. Laura Swain retained uh, the casket key, carefully labeling it and setting aside, setting it aside uh, to be preserved uh, for now for, for many, many years in the Font Hill collection. At the end of his life, a disillusioned and disappointed Mercer felt himself uh, something of a failure, and it took several more decades for others to recognize and appreciate uh, his genius and his accomplishments in, in all of those fields, ceramics and architecture, museums, historical scholarship. Um, but here again, I, wanna, I want to sort of wrap up by recognizing that uh, Mercer was more uh, than his public life, as, as we all are. Um, and uh, reflect uh, on other aspects of his life and interests. Um, and also to, to reflect and celebrate um, those individuals who helped Mercer, uh, his, his household staff, Laura Long, Frank Swain, Ben Barnes, uh, some of those folks sort of who were behind the scenes uh, at Font Hill and behind the scenes in Mercer's life, but certainly uh, have to give, be given credit for helping Mercer have the time and space um, to uh, uh, to accomplish all of the all of the things he was able to accomplish in his life. Um, so with that, uh, I conclude uh, my remarks. Um, I know there's a, there's a lot there. Uh, there's so much more, so many anecdotes, so many other sort of insights uh, into Mercer that are easy um, uh, or hard to to to, uh, to include in a in a 45 minute talk. Um, but I'd be happy to take any any questions that folks have. 
Corey, thank you so much. It's so fascinating to hear about, um, just like you said, the private life of Henry Mercer. We, we often learn about people's accomplishments that are, uh, that are public, but not often about their relationships, friendships, things like that. So thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm looking in the chat here. We do have a question from Sandy asking if the Linden boarding house still exists. Uh, no, uh, no, it was it was torn down years ago. There's a, a nursing facility there. It's the corner of uh, of uh, Maple and uh, and East uh, Streets in Doylestown. Folks, just saying thank you for such an interesting presentation. I see that Barbara Mills has raised her hand. Um, Barbara, I'm going to allow you to talk if you'd like to ask your question to Corey. So were the brothers um, estranged when Henry died and did William yes. go to the funeral? Yes, I mean, well, uh, uh, yes, they were, they were estranged at the time of, uh, of, uh, of Mercer's death. They hadn't really spoken uh, in, uh, in some time. Yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the, you know, one of the very sad, uh, uh, sad conclusions of Mercer's life because they, they were close, you know, at one time uh, in, their, in their lives and it was really the, the, uh, I mean, Mercer had, had essentially signed over all interest uh, in Old Aldi to, uh, uh, to his brother, never imagining uh, that, uh, that he would tear the place down. But it sounds like from all accounts, the place was kind of a wreck. Uh, it hadn't, you know, it hadn't been maintained well in a while. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Willie um, seemed to feel that the only choice was to tear it down. And it had too many memories for Mercer, I think. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, so much of his life was spent there, um, both public and private life. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it, was, it was a rupture that was never, uh, uh, that was never restored uh, prior to his death. Thank you for your question, Barbara. You're welcome. <laughs> um, some questions in the chat. Uh, where was Henry Mercer born? Uh, he was born in uh, in what is known today as the James Laura House, the headquarters of the uh, Village Improvement Association at the corner of Main Street and Broad Street, uh, kind of right across the street from uh, the courthouse. Thank you. Um, one question from Peter. Uh, is there any connection in his effects to Carl Schurz or and Fanny Chapman? I know Schurz got him some Indian artifacts. Yeah, um, that that's a whole other story, and I know there's a there's an author who has been who has been writing uh, writing a, a book, I believe, on uh, the uh, the connection between Fanny uh, Fanny uh, Chapman and and uh, and Carl Schurz. Uh, um, who was a German American? Uh, served as an officer in the in the Civil War. Um, I don't know a lot about that. I'm going to leave uh, leave leave another to uh, another scholar to uh, uh, to report on uh, on that. Uh, but uh, uh, but apparently there was uh, you know there there was quite a lot in their uh, in their relationship. But it's not something I've I've uh, spent much time looking at myself. Sure. Uh, question, is the room you mentioned really called the saloon or is it the salon? Yeah, Mercer referred to it as the, as the saloon. Uh, the, the salon, I think, would have been too pretentious uh, for, uh, for Mercer. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was referred to as the saloon, the largest room in the house. Uh, certainly the room that, that uh, Mercer would have most likely, when he was entertaining, most likely would have entertained guests or received, uh, received guests. Um, a question coming in, uh, Barbara had a second question saying she's heard that the old Aldi was where the Burger King is. Is that correct? Well, roughly, if you, it's really sort of the area where the Weiss Market, uh, the Weiss Market is that that corner of uh, Lime Kiln and, and uh, North Main Street uh, was the was the Mercer Estate. And that's why the, the new Aldi is is right behind there, uh, but uh, but that that corner was uh, was the uh, was the Aldi estate. Yeah, a question from Richard asking, how was the estate passed on? You mean Mercer's Mercer's estate? I believe he does mean Mercer's estate, but Richard, if you want to clarify, yeah. So 
so Mercer at, at Mercer's death and and the will he set up and and uh, I don't recall every single aspect of the will, but um, the will he set up essentially gave life rights to reside at Font Hill um, uh, to uh, to Laura and Frank Swain and ownership of the tile works to Frank Swain. Um, and uh, although he he left uh, he left Font Hill um, to a trust, the Mercer Font Hill Trust, which had a a board of trustees um, to administer that uh, that trust, um, with the idea that uh, after Laura's life rights had had uh, expired, the house would become a museum of tiles and prints, as he as he originally uh, envisioned it. Uh, and um, it was around the time of, of Laura, Laura Swain's death that, um, that the Bucks County Historical Society came to operate um, the Mercer Font Hill Trust. And then it was right around 1990 that the Board of Trustees of the Mercer Font Hill Trust um, was replaced by the Board of Trustees of the Bucks County Historical Society. Um, so one and the same. And of course, Mercer left um, left uh, some monies for the operation of the Bucks County, the Mercer Museum, the Bucks County Historical Society as well. And there were some other legacies uh, there left in his will. Great. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Dolores wants to know, did Henry Mercer ever write about his disillusionment and disappointment about not completing his life's work, or was that told only verbally? No, it's it's sort of reading between the lines and some of his correspondences um, and some of his the frustrations that you know that that he expressed. Um, uh, so a lot of it, a lot of it, it really stems from uh, from some of his own his own sort of private writings, um, and uh, as well as impressions that others like like Joe Sanford, uh, uh, you know, had. Uh, who, uh, who was this young art and design student that somehow or another Mercer had befriended um, because uh, uh, and that's, that would be just an interesting thing to, to, to probe a little bit more. Um, but uh, Sanford had uh, had some of the most, some of the most intimate sort of personal insights into, into Mercer having visited Font Hill and Mercer at a time when um, others, you know, there weren't others who were, who were that close to him who were visiting regularly. Um, so, um, uh, so it, it's a combination of things. It's others' impressions as well as uh, um, things said in, in some of his correspondence. Corey, uh, do you know where Rollo's name came from? <laughs> well, the name is Norse uh, or, 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 originally, um, and uh, um, and I should I should be familiar with uh, with uh, uh, Norse legend and. Uh, uh, the ancient kings, <laughs> things like that. But I, I, I know that uh, that uh, that Rollo is a is a name uh, that uh, that descends from uh, some of the ancient uh, the ancient monarchs of uh, uh, in in uh, in Norse history. Fascinating. Um, we have a question asking if he left anything to Ben, his driver. You know that's a good question. I don't know that. I'd have to go back to Mercer's will. I'm I'm, I'm always happy to say things I don't know, um, and that's and I I don't uh, I don't I I would be surprised that he didn't, but I can't I can't picture anything in the will right now. So that's that's on me. Now I'll have, I'll have to go look for that. Sure. Um, a number of accounts describe Mercer as a gay man who destroyed much of his correspondence before he died. Is there any evidence of same-sex romance? None that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, and, and uh, there's there's nothing that, and, and and not just me, but you know, others over the over the years, you know, biographers and and uh, um, you know, and others uh, you know, writing about the tile works and so on and so forth uh, have ever uncovered anything specific that would suggest uh, a uh, suggest that Mercer was gay. Um, uh, and to the contrary, uh, you know, thing, there's things are there's more suggestions to the contrary, um, but uh, um, but you know, and whether whether anything was destroyed, possibly we don't know. You know, obviously we don't know what's not here. Uh, so and who might have done it? But uh, but there's nothing in anything that survives uh, that would suggest um, that he was gay. Gotcha. 
Um, I do want to share just from Joy saying that uh, wanted, she wanted to let everybody know that the James Laura House will be hosting an open house in June for Henry's 165th birthday. <laughs> and the room he was born in will be on that tour. So for anyone interested in more on that history. Um, let's see here. When did Henry Mercer begin collecting objects from pre-industrial America? Um, so uh, the late 1890s, as he turned his his uh, uh, his attention from um, prehistoric archaeology, essentially when he was working at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, and then returned to to Doylestown after a bit of a falling out at, at Penn, um, and uh, uh, this this he, he told us he told a story of the uh, whether how exactly true it is, but he told a story of the origins of the collection being a, a visit to a local junk dealer. Um, and uh, Mercer had this epiphany that uh, after having searched for pre-industrial or prehistoric tools for as long as he had and evidence of prehistoric cultures in the in the ground uh, as a dirt archaeologist, um, he was struck by all of these things that were being discarded in his own lifetime uh, due to the industrial uh, industrial age. Uh, and decided that uh, that he would he would approach uh, collecting as an archaeologist, but to try to collect the more recent past and and evidence of of uh, pre-industrial uh, tools and and objects of everyday life. Yeah, Henry Mercer had such a strong interest in that for the whole latter part of his life. And uh, if anyone can see my virtual background, you will see part of his collection of pre-industrial tools that is on display at the Mercer Museum. Kelly wants to know if the Swains allowed visitors to tour Font Hill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, we, we can imagine, you know, our own houses and how happy we would be if people were constantly showing up on our doorstep and ringing the doorbell and asking for a tour. But but that was typical. <laughs> it was typical in, 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 in Mercer's lifetime. Um, and uh, and that was one of the things that that Laura had to put up with is people would just show up and, and be intrigued by the house. You know, I have to remember this is a time when when visiting. I mean, and, and speaking personally, I mean, I was appall appalled as a as a young boy the way my mother would just go and visit somebody without announcing that she was coming. You know, just walk up to somebody's door and say I'm here and sort of expect to be let in and entertained and you know things like that. And that was certainly true at in in, in Mercer's time um, that uh, that folks just showed up and and Laura gave them a tour. Um, and Mercer, you know, unless he was particularly interested in the guest, uh, found a, a way to make himself scarce. And then after uh, after Mercer died, the same thing continued to happen. Uh, Laura was uh, was uh, the um, um, was the uh, tour guide uh, for Font Hill for uh, for years and years and years and years. Um, and people would show up looking for a looking for a tour. Um, so uh, so yeah. <laughs> and she did that not, you know, not many years before she, you know, she passed away. Yeah. Um, and did the Swains have any children? No. No. A couple, just a few more questions here. Um, Corey, if you have it in you to answer some more. Um, Kelly was also wondering what was more, what more of his life's work was he hoping to accomplish and do we know any more about? Yeah, I think part of it was, you know, I think, you know, looking looking at what he had done at the at the Mercer Museum, um, you know, he was he was uh, a little disillusioned that the that he hadn't been able himself to um, to get uh, historians um, to see history in the material terms that he saw history in. Um, and to sort of reorient the practice of history um, in a more material direction. Um, so, uh, you know, he really wanted and hoped that uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, historians, uh, folklorists would be the path to the Mercer Museum uh, to learn how to do history from what he called this new point of view, from the standpoint of, of artifacts, and particularly from the standpoint of, of, uh, uh, of an evolution of technology. Um, and uh, and that wasn't who were coming, you know. And he he talked about the, uh, you know, the folks, the 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 antique dealers who just wanted to figure out how to gouge the public, uh, and uh, uh, and and so I think that was that was a lot of it. Is that I think he had hoped to really 
um, revolutionize uh, the practice of history, and, and it just didn't it didn't happen for him. Um, he had been invited, um, not in the 1920s, to uh, speak to the then pretty new American. American Association of Museums, now the American Alliance of Museums. Uh, it's fascinating to imagine what he might have said, uh, you know, or what or what influence he might have had um, on, uh, you know, on museums uh, in the in the era. Uh, but I think that was that was a lot of his uh, of his disillusionment. Plus, you know, <laughs> you know, as as we all get older, we we take issues with uh, with with everything new, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so uh, uh, you know the. the Part of the reason that he had the doctor that he did, uh, I think, is that the, this particular doctor um, was willing to to listen to all of Mercer's complaints about, you know, uh, how you know modern life had just gone to heck, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, not every doctor was going to sit there for an hour listening to you know an old fella, you know, just uh, talk about how how bad things <laughs> are in the present. So. Uh, you know, I think that I think that a lot of it was, you know, was modernity and his inability to accommodate himself to to the changes in in American life and culture, as as well as again his his inability to to reorient the field of of uh, historical scholarship. Yeah. Wonder what Henry Mercer would think of us all with cell phones in our pockets these days. <laughs> Um, Dolores wondered if there has ever been any interest by a biographer to do professional and thorough biography of Mercer. There seems to be so much material here in what he accomplished and leaves behind. Absolutely. Mercer is begging for a biographer, a full biographer. Now, obviously there was the, you know, the book that, uh, the, the very good book that Cleota Reed did years ago on the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works and its history, which has a lot of biography in it, but, but obviously focused primarily on, on Mercer as a, as a ceramist. Uh, and, and on the tile works uh, historically. Um, so, you know, other than, you know, an article here or there, um, there is, uh, there, there really is a, is a, there's a lot of material uh, that could, uh, uh, that could satisfy a biographer who wanted to, uh, who wanted to do that, uh, uh, do that scholarly exercise. So let all those biographers you all know let them know that Henry Mercer is uh, is a topic that is ripe for the picking. <laughs> um, I see that Joy has her hand raised. So Joy, I'm gonna select for you to talk and unmute. Hello. Hi, Joy. We can hear you. Hi. Yeah, no, I had forgotten I had it raised. I just wanted to speak a little bit about the James Laura Memorial House, which um, I'm on the committee with the VIA, um, which was a house that was built for, um, was built by Judge Chapman, Henry's grandfather, for his second wife, who was the daughter of the governor of Pennsylvania, Nancy. Um, and uh, it is a house that Aunt Layla um, lived in as the uh, stepdaughter of Nancy, the daughter of uh, Judge Chapman. And um, she was married there also, um, as I found a clipping in uh, newspapers.com with her um, marriage announcement. So yeah, so we are hoping once COVID is over to, um, you know, reintroduce the community to more about the James Laura House with more regular tours. And, uh, you know, Henry's 165th birthday will be, um, hoping to have people tour the house because it was it is full of 80 years worth of um, the James family, James and Laura family's um, uh, personal effects and furniture and, and just everything. So I uh, um, hope that some people are interested and they'll come out for that tour. Thank you, Joy. Joy, thanks so much for sharing that information. Um, Corey, Joel is wondering how his book November Night Tales was received by critics <laughs> and the public. Yeah, Mercer was certainly, um, you know, obviously sad that that uh, his uh, his publication was not a rip roaring success. Um, so uh, yeah, there, there were there were very few copies that actually uh, actually were sold, unfortunately. Um, um, and I think maybe our last question, um, but Linda was asking how Mercer felt about women's suffrage. Yeah, yeah. Um, Interesting. I, I I do not um, or cannot recall, and I can't believe it doesn't exist. Um, I, I do not recall 
anything specifically. He certainly wrote about, you know, short dresses and, you know, things like bobbed hair and things like that, um, um, you know, in terms of fashion uh, and, and propriety. Um, but I can't recall um, seeing anything specifically regarding suffrage uh, in, Mercer's, uh, in Mercer's writings. Um, and uh, uh, again, <laughs> I haven't, I've never had the opportunity to read all of his, all of his writings, but uh, um, something, we have something, something to look into. I do not, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I, one individual other than Francis Lerman, who he seems to have had some, um, some sort of relationship, it's hard to understand exactly what, but uh, there was an Ethel Arnold uh, in, uh, in England um, who uh, there's there's some correspondence uh, between the between the two of them, and Ethel Arnold is an interesting character because she toured the United States, uh, uh, giving talks on on uh, the economics of uh, the economics of of women's status or something you know something like that. I believe she was an English suffragette, uh, as it were, um, and uh, she was also interestingly she was part of the same family. She was related to the author Aldous Huxley. Uh, she, um, I think her grandfather was, um, uh, was the headmaster uh, of the private school in England that uh, uh, became the setting for the novel Tom Brown School Boy, is this Tom, Tom Brown School Days, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, in any case, uh, there seems to have been some, some affection one way or the other, or maybe both ways uh, with, with this Ethel Arnold. Um, uh, again, is another, uh, you know, another potential uh, romantic interest of Mercer's. Um, and, and as I said, she, I think she probably had some fairly uh, firm ideas on, on the rights of women. That's the closest I can come. <laughs> Well, I don't see any more questions coming through, but I will just share that many folks have just said, thank you, Corey, very much for an insightful, wonderful, interesting talk. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today and a special thank you to the Friends of the Bucks County Historical Society for uh, putting on this program and for all the wonderful work that they do um, to fund and uh, fun projects here at the Mercer Museum and as well as interesting programs and um, other events that they hold. So I will, uh, with that, we'll conclude. I wanna thank you all for joining us and um, please check our website for any of our other virtual program offerings. We have some great stuff coming up in March and April as well. I hope everyone had, um, oh, one final question. The recording will be available. Thank you for asking Sandy. Um, in the next few days, we will aim to get this recording up on our website um, and our YouTube page. So you can check back on the Friends of BCHS webpage at mercermuseum.org. Um, and when that is available, we will make sure to post the link there. So everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Corey, thank you again.